Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I want to share my highlights from the latest Monish Pabrai lecture and Q&A. This one was uh, given at Peking University. It was actually given over Zoom, uh, but with the students at Peking University. Now, I was a little disappointed when I noticed this. The, this lecture was given at the beginning of December, okay? Uh, and it just came out yesterday, February 14th. You guys, that's more than like a 13F lag time, okay? So, you know, I'm hoping Pabrai can kind of pick it up in the future. But to be honest, this was a fantastic, fantastic talk and Q&A session. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to dive into this. So without further ado, let's jump right in. The name of the talk uh, of the lecture was Compounding with the Spawners, okay? Uh, 10 to 100 baggers, the holy grail of investing. Uh, and it's really all about kind of these, these insights that Pabrai got last year in 2020 to really change his whole framework for um, investing, moving from you know buying a dollar bill for 50 cents to identifying these great long-term compounders. Um, so just to go through the talk part of it, which was like the first 40 minutes out of the hour and 40 minutes. Um, so, you know, Brian talks about how in 1994, he discovered Warren Buffett. That was his year of greatest learning. Okay. The, the year he learned the most, uh, just drinking from the fire hose of Warren Buffett. Uh, 2020 was the second greatest year of learning. For Pabrai. And he talked about that also in, in the previous talk uh, that he did. But, you know, it gets a little bit more in the weeds here. So um, he really picked up from Nick Sleep, who managed a fund in the UK, Nomad, I believe it was Nomad Investment Partnership, something like that. Um, and, you know, reading Nick Sleep's annual letters to shareholders really spurred him to hunt for these spawners, okay? Um, now there's two kinds of businesses, kind of a high level, right? You've got businesses that have growing pies um, where, you know, the, the business is growing year after year. The pie, the piece of the pie is getting, not the piece of the pie, the whole pie is getting bigger and bigger. So if you own part of that business, um, your stake is growing because the, the whole pie is growing. Uh, and those are really set it and forget it types of investment opportunities. Have 10 to 100 bagger potential, all right? Those are the growing pies. The second one is discounted pies, where you're buying a dollar for 50 cents. You're buying it because uh, you can pay less than you think it's worth kind of today, okay? You're not factoring in any growth moving forward. Um, so it's really, you're flipping. It's kind of a short-term flip, um, maybe one to three years, hoping the market uh, prices that business in alignment with the value that you've determined for that business. Uh, now that's a treadmill of activity, buying these discounted pies, right? Because every couple of years, you got to flip in and out of new positions. It's also tax inefficient, right? Every time you sell, you've got to pay, you know, the capital gains tax. Um, so you get a chunk taken out each time um, you kind of flip these these fifty cent dollar bills, um, and it's tough to get more than a two to three x on these discounted pies. It's just the nature of of the discounted pies. Um, so he's very focused on growing pies now, right? Moving from discounted pies to growing pies. Now within the growing pies space, there's basically five different types of businesses within the growing pies, um, within the kind of 10 to 100 bagger realm. So what are these five? The first one is focused mouse traps, okay? Uh, narrowly focused players with long runways. And Pabrai gives the example of Mao Tai, which is a, a liquor producer in China. Uh, that's all they do. They, they do, you know, one thing, they do it very well. Um, 
and they do have a long runway, a growing business. Uh, the second one, great capital allocators. So, you know, of course, we think of Warren Buffett with Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, Donaher is another one. Um, you know, they, they are these growing pies, these great long-term compounders because they have a great capital allocator at the helm. Uh, I'm actually reading a book right now called Outsiders, which, you know, basically does nine case studies on these great capital allocators. I highly recommend that book. Uh, the third way, Uber Cannibals. So these are businesses that have an intense focus on share buybacks, right? Because um, if you own a piece of a business uh, and there are fewer and fewer shares outstanding each year because the company is using their excess cash to buy back those shares, to retire those shares, um, that's, that's a great way for, for you to, for your piece to grow. Um, so the pie doesn't grow, but your piece of it grows. That's the Uber cannibals. Uh, the fourth one is deep value plays, right? Where the market just says, really misunderstanding um, the situation. That includes Fiat Chrysler, Rain Industries, um, you know, positions that Pabrai has owned in the past. Uh, he still owns Rain, I believe, in India. So those are the first four. Now, the fifth one is the one that Pabrai is really diving into. He wants his portfolio in the next couple of years to be composed of only this fifth type of business. And that's the spawners, right? Spawners is his current focus. So these are companies that continuously spawn related and unrelated businesses, okay? Uh, very few companies have the DNA to become great spawners. Uh, it's pretty, pretty unusual for a company to be able to do this. Uh, company DNA reflects a deep conviction in the importance of relentlessly adding and incubating new businesses that have potential to be massive growth engines, okay? Um, <clears throat> and some examples, Amazon, right? Google, Alibaba, Berkshire Hathaway, Tencent, Baidu. Uh, these are some examples that are obviously huge companies now. <coughs> Uh, fantastic examples of spawning companies that have this spawning DNA, right? Uh, they've always had it. Um, right. So, and and these these businesses, these spawners. Uh, uh, one characteristic is they make many small bets, okay, and they double down on the winners. So this is really important. Uh, as an entrepreneur, really good entrepreneurs uh, do not bet the farm on you know a single you know bet that you know they're unsure of the outcome, right? They make small bets on many outcome, many many different you know opportunities, and the the ones that are working, the ones that are winning. Uh, you slowly kind of add more and more capital to. And that's really the story of Amazon. Uh, there have been so many things tried at Amazon in terms of different types of businesses, both related to Amazon's initial, um, you know, book retail business and businesses that have been very unrelated to that. You know, you think of the cloud, Amazon Web Services. Um, but it's about making many bets, uh, knowing that, you know, a few are going to work out. That's really the, the venture capital kind of approach to um, entrepreneurship. Many bets, and then, you know, if you have enough and you do them well, you know a few are going to hit, and those are just going to really drive the ship uh, at the end of the day. So within spawning, uh, there's there's a number of different types of spawners, okay? Uh, there's actually four different types. The first one, adjacent spawners, create related businesses, okay? Um, the second is embryonic spawners, acquire businesses when they're young and they nurture them into much larger enterprises. 
Uh, the third is cloner spawners. They don't innovate, they copy. Okay, that's how they spawn new businesses. And then the fourth one, non-adjacent spawners create or buy new unrelated businesses. Okay. Uh, now, Pabrai, the thing, the businesses that he's really after are ones that combine all of these four different types of spawning. Okay. And those he calls the apex spawners. Um, they utilize all four categories, uh, which means they have so many different paths to nirvana, to the promised land. Um, they have so many powerful tools uh, to become these behemoth businesses um, that really create wealth for investors. Um, so that's the first part of his talk. Um, so what does spawning really do? Spawning extends the runway of a business, okay? Uh, say you have your core business. Now, capitalism is brutal. There are constantly going to be competitors who are coming in to try to take market share away from you, from that core business. But if you're constantly spawning off these, you know, related and unrelated businesses, um, even if that first one dies, even if that first one gets clobbered by the competition, you've got all these other bets, right? And some of them, uh, if you've got a really intelligent management team, a really skilled management team at the helm, are gonna, they're gonna hit. Um, so you're gonna extend your runway for, for growth, for compounding, and it's also gonna hedge the runway. Right? You're not counting on this one thing working out and being dominant for decades. Um, it really keeps the mothership young and healthy. Uh, and you know, we've seen that in spades uh, with what's happened at Amazon. Uh, so rules on spawning investing. Okay, Pabri has come up with some rules uh, to guide his own spawning approach. Now, there were 3,700 IPOs in the US in the last 20 years, right? Since 2000, 3,700 IPOs. Only nine of those businesses exceed 100 billion in market cap today, okay? So nine out of 3,700 got to 100 billion. Um, now, if you assume the upper limit if you assume an upper limit on the market cap of any business you invest in will not exceed 50 billion. Okay, that's an assumption we're gonna make. I'm gonna assume if I invest in one of these spawners, uh, it's not gonna get higher than 50 billion market cap. All right, we saw only nine hit 100 billion. So it's probably unlikely that we pick a company that's even gonna get half that. So that's going to be what we assume. We're not going to be able to exceed 50 billion market cap. Now, using that assumption, if you want a 10 bagger, you have to shop below a 5 billion market cap. Okay. Say you buy a company that's, a, you know, it's got a market capitalization of $5 billion and it, you know, you, you actually hit 50 billion, right? That's going to be a 10 X. So, we don't want to be above that 5 billion if we're looking to get a 10x. Now, if we want a 100 bagger, which of course we want a 100 bagger, who doesn't? Um, we have to shop below 500 million market cap. Okay, you find a 500 million market cap, 100 times that is going to give us that 50 billion market cap. So, you know, the big takeaway here is we, we got to catch these spawners early in the game in order to be able to ride, you know, that, that, uh, that compound growth over years, over decades. We've got to catch it small. Um, because if we get in, you know, at 100 billion, at 500 billion, you know, looking at companies like Alibaba, Facebook, Google, Apple, I mean, how much larger can these things possibly get? We've got serious headwinds uh, if we're getting in at those kind of market caps, hoping it's going to be a 10 bagger or a 100 bagger, uh, the odds are against us in the in in those cases. So we want to catch them early. 
Uh, the challenge is the earlier you show up in a company's life, the wider the range of outcomes. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's, there's more uncertainty the earlier we get in. Uh, that's just, that's just a fact of life. So, you know, Pabri's kind of sweet spot is looking somewhere around 500 million. We don't want to go too small, probably, because then we don't have enough history of the company to look at to try to figure out, all right, does this company, does this management team have spawner DNA? So we don't want to get too small, but obviously we don't want to get too big. There's kind of a, a sweet spot there. Uh, spawning is not a trait that you can easily screen for, right? So we can't just go into value line or uh, whatever screening you know service you use and easily uh, use quantitative screening methods to find these spawners. It, it's just, you know, Pabri hasn't found an easy way to do that, at least if he has. He didn't reveal it uh, in this talk, uh, but I trust him. I trust that he hasn't found an easy way to do that. So we really need to look at the history of the business, right? So it's very laborious. Um, I'm sure there are some ways to screen down to kind of a pool that's more likely. And then we've just got to look at the history of management, kind of the track record of management and suss out whether this company has the spawner DNA or not. Um, and, you know, a big part of that is, does it have a great capital allocator at the helm, right? Um, we don't need to make heroic assumptions, right? The, the future should be obvious from the past behavior and the successes and failures of these businesses. Pabri says, you know, if you look, if you look at the track record of management, if you look at what the company has already done, um, you know, we, we should be looking at companies that have at least a 10-year track record. Uh, and if they have a 10-year track record or, or maybe longer, uh, there should be enough there to kind of tease out whether or not this company has this spawner DNA. And if there's not enough there, it's a pass. You know, we, we just move on. Um, but Brian wants to get to a portfolio that has only spawners, okay? Within a couple of years, uh, this is his ideal. A, a portfolio, say 10 companies that are only spawners, okay? There's nothing else in there. Uh, ideally, they're only apex spawners, right? They have a number of different ways to spawn this massive growth. Uh, ideally, they're only apex spawners that are smaller than a 500 million market cap. All right. That's really the sweet spot. Uh, so this is great. He's really giving us kind of a high level blueprint of what he's going to be, uh, you know, tr he calls, he refers to his portfolio as an aircraft carrier, right? It's this, you know, 500 million plus, you know, behemoth of a fund. And he thinks it's going to take a couple of years to turn the aircraft carrier from his old strategy, which was buying a dollar bill for 50 cents, to this portfolio of beautiful long-term compounding spawners. So you guys, this is fantastic. We are at the ground floor of being able to witness Monish Pabrai. Um, completely, you know, transforming his portfolio into something that's, you know, seemingly much more powerful in terms of the kinds of returns that he's going to be able to generate moving forward. So what a time to be a shameless cloner. What a fantastic time. Um, he said he had three businesses in his portfolio that are great spawners, right? Recently, he found a fourth. Uh, and he describes it as a 400 million market cap, uh, strong spawning DNA, and very long history. Okay, and we're actually going to get to what company. I'm pretty sure that is. I'm pretty sure we know uh, what company Pabri is talking about here, based on some clues that he dropped. Uh, but we're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, the hunt is on to find more of these. A big reason why he's giving this talk uh, at Peking University is 
Some of Pabrai's best ideas have come from people emailing him, sending him ideas, right? And he's giving this talk in China, um, where they're, you know, what China has done over the last couple of decades in terms of, you know, the stock market in China, the economy in China, it's just been remarkable. So, you know, Pabrai's probably thinking there's, there's probably a lot more potential great spawners in China uh, than there is in most other countries. So he's pretty excited to be planting these seeds to these students, uh, hoping to get something, some leads back from that. Uh, and then almost the end of his um, lecture here, he gives a quote from Thomas Phelps, for the individual or institution, really out to make a fortune in the stock market, it can be argued that every sale is a confession of error. Okay, Thomas Phelps in his book, 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. And obviously it's a very powerful quote. Um, and it's so aligned with this transition that Pabrai is making in his uh, investment approach. Um, and then the last, yeah, just the last thing he says in his talk, he says an entire portfolio of five to 10 great spawners bought at reasonable prices and below our market cap limits is likely to do very well. Um, and it can do very well with just a couple home runs, right? So Nick Sleep, you know, most of the portfolio for Nick Sleep was in Berkshire, Costco, and Amazon. I think like 90% of it was in those three companies. Now Berkshire underperformed the market during those years when Nick Sleep was holding it. Uh, Costco, you know, probably beat the market, but it didn't beat it by much. Uh, it was really Amazon that just, you know, crushed it. Amazon became like 60%, I think, near the end of Nomad uh, Investment Partnership. Amazon was like 60% of the portfolio. Uh, and part of the reason Nick Sleep shut down the portfolio or shut down the fund is because there were these regulators who were pestering him. Like, you've got, you know, one position that makes up 60% of your fund. Uh, isn't that risky? You know, shouldn't you diversify a bit more? So there was this regulatory pressure coming at him, and that's part of why he liquidated the fund, returned the money to shareholders, uh, investors, and kind of went on his own. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's Pabrai's talk. Let's get into the Q&A, the Q&A portion. So we're going to get right into this company that I think Pabrai is talking about as his most recent spawner, okay? So he says, you know, I found a spawner in Japan, right? Uh, it was founded in 1985, IPO'd in 2003. Uh, he said the founder is 55 years old. Um so that, that gave us some hints. So what I did, another thing that gave us hints, if you guys have access to uh, Ticker Terminal. Ticker Terminal allows you to look at kind of the international holdings of a lot of the kind of guru investors in the U.S. Uh, and so Pabrai, you know, had a position just show up, I think, December 31st on Ticker and it was a Japanese company, okay? Um, so I already kind of knew, uh, I kind of expected that this was coming, but um, uh, if you, and the company I, I strongly believe it to be is Shinokin, okay? Shinokin in Japan. Um, the founder is 55 years old, which is exactly what Pabrai said. But Bryce said it was founded around 1985. This Shinokin was actually founded in 1990, so five years off there. Uh, but he did say the founder, uh, when the company was founded, was 25 years old. Um, and that lines up with, you know, the company being founded in 1990, which is exactly what we have here. So, you know, he's going off some of this from memory, so the numbers weren't completely accurate there, but I'm, I'm pretty confident it's Shinikin. And something that is interesting to do is to just look at this kind of history of Shinikin. 
uh, and you can really see some pretty strong um, spawner DNA uh, in you know what what's transpired over the last 30 years at Shinikin. So it's it's really interesting to to look through this. So I'll link to this uh, company history in the description. Check that out. So anyway, um, yeah. Um, so getting back to the Q and A, you know, he was asked about about spawners, and to one question he responded, you know, if you can only find one spawner a year, that's enough. Okay, so yeah, these things are probably going to be hard to find, right? We can't quantitatively screen for them. Um, you know, we, we've got to kind of dig through one at a time, look at the, the track record of management, the history of the company. Um, so it's going to take some work. But if all we can do is find one each year, that's plenty. That's plenty, guys. And of course, we get to see what the man himself is doing uh, in both his 13F filings for U.S. companies and in ticker terminal for these international holdings. So just a fantastic uh, edge we have. Um, so he talked a little bit about Google here. He said historically when he looked at Google or Alphabet, he would ascribe a value of zero to these other bets, right? So Google is a company that's always trying, um, you know, businesses related to Google and just kind of moonshot uh, businesses. Um, and Pavrai, you know, he always looked at that thinking, well, I, I don't really know how to value those, those other bets, right? Those long shots. Um, so I'm just, uh, I, I'm going to put a zero on it. I'm not going to factor it into my valuation of Google. Now he sees it differently, right? These other bets uh, indicate to Pabrai that Google has this spawner DNA, okay? Um, so it's not necessarily going to affect how he values the company, um, but what it does now, because Pabrai only wants spawners, it allows Google to be in that, you know, in the running. He's not going to di immediately disqualify Google because it's got that spawner DNA. Now, of course, he's not interested in Google because it's such a big company, right? I don't even know what the market cap of Google is, but I actually looked up what the market cap was when it IPO'd, right? When it first became a public company. Uh, and the market cap was $23 billion. So there never really would have been an opportunity for Pabrai to buy Google using the current framework that he has. $23 billion does not meet our $5 billion market cap threshold you know, for a 10 bagger. And it certainly doesn't meet our 500 million market cap threshold for a 100 bagger. So, Pabrai talked about Chamath Palihapitiya. Okay. I was fascinated by this. Um, Chamath is a guy I've been following. Uh, obviously, he's maybe not obviously, he's got a huge following on Twitter. Uh, he's kind of the SPAC king, right? He's got IPOA, IPOB, IPOC. And he plans to have all the way down through IPOZ. Um, he's got a ton of SPACs. It'll be interesting when he gets to IPOO, IPU, right? That's going to be a shit show. Uh, we'll see what happens with that one. But uh, so Pabrai sees Chamath as a spawner, right? He's spawning out all of these SPACs. Um, and while Pabrai doesn't want to invest in these individual SPACs because, you know, they're, they're kind of long shots, right? They're, they're darn near startups uh, in most cases. And um, so, but as a whole, uh, Pabrai would love to be able to invest in Shamath, right? If he could invest in a parent company that has all of these SPACs within it, um, Pabrai would, would get excited about that. And that was interesting to hear him say that. And of course, I've, I can't wait for Chamath to kind of release a holding company 
that, that we can buy as the general public. Um, you know, hopefully it's not priced to the moon because, you know, there's so much hype around Chamath. Uh, but, you know, it, it's pretty compelling. And I've also bought into, I think, three of Chamath's SPACs so far. I think IPO, D, E, and F. Um, IPO E announced a merger with uh, Social Finance, SoFi, and, and that popped big. I was able to get all of my initial investment out, and I just, I, I've left in um, maybe half of what that initial stake amount was to just let it ride with SoFi. So I don't have any risk in that bet anymore. But it was fun to hear him talk about uh, Chamath because. You know, it can seem like those two worlds are completely separate, right? You get Chamath over here in SPAC land, you know, in a speculation bubble. And then you've got Pabrai over here, who's, you know, got more of a Buffett, very kind of rigorous value approach. And it seems like, you know, with his new framework, um, the, the worlds are moving a little bit closer. It's, it's kind of fun to see. Uh, he says Chamath is going to do very well. He's making lots of bets in high potential areas, and he only needs a few of them to work. That's so. That's that. Um, let's see. Right, he's asked more about spawners. We want at least ten to fifteen years of history to determine whether the company has true spawner DNA. Uh, a key trait of great spawners are small bet sizes, right? Until they see traction. They're unwilling to bet the farm. Now, Pabrai talks a lot about this in The Dondo Investor, where true entrepreneurs are very risk averse, right? Um, you know, they're looking for these upside without downside opportunities. You know, I think of Richard Branson calling up Boeing, asking, you know, how much it would cost for him to rent a plane for, I don't know if it was a week or a month or what it was to try to figure out if, if this business model, right, for, for Virgin, um, Virgin Atlantic was going to work. So capping the downside, and that's, you know, essential for a company to have the spawner DNA, to have that kind of risk averse mindset. Uh, he talked about Elon Musk and how Pabrai gets nervous because um, he thinks Elon Musk, you know, doesn't care about money, right? Elon, you know, he wants to get to Mars. He, you know, he, he just, he, he's not focused on optimizing, you know, uh, returns for his investors. That That's not where his focus is. He wants to shift the paradigm in a number of, you know, different areas um, in, you know, clean energy, particularly with electric vehicles, electric transportation, uh, in some pretty exciting areas. Uh, but but Pabrai's point here is Elon makes him nervous as an investor because he could easily make a big bet on something that's unproven, right? He doesn't think like like an entrepreneur whose sole focus is to uh, grow wealth, uh, which is making these small bets on these long shots. Elon could easily bet the farm on a long shot. Um, so it was interesting to hear him talk about Elon. Um, right, someone asked about Bezos, how Bezos is stepping down as CEO. You know, is Amazon still going to be a spawner? Right, that's that's a big question. Um, how much of that, you know, DNA of Amazon will remain intact through that transition? But Bryce said, when a business like Amazon transitions to the next leader, um, will the will the spawner DNA transfer? We're going to have to wait and see. We don't know. Um, he was asked about. Um, Something about, you know, if an investor sells, what, what can we glean from that? Like, we're a shameless cloner. We're looking at 13 Fs. Uh, if we see somebody, if we see an investor sell, you know, how can we interpret that? 
But Bryce says investors buy stocks for only one reason. Okay, they're they're bullish on the business. That's that's why they buy. It's not entirely true. Well, so insiders can sometimes buy just to signal to the market that they think, you know, it, it's a good buy at those prices, because uh, there are investors who look at insider activity. Um, so you know there could be some funny business going on there, but by and large, investors do only buy for one reason. It's a strong signal that they're bullish. Uh, investors sell stocks for a hundred reasons, right? Uh, they, they need cash for, for who knows how many, there's, there's many, many things uh, that, that we need cash for, right, as investors. So it's not necessarily a strong indication that the investor isn't, isn't interested in that company anymore if there's some kind of trimming of a position. Um, so that, that was a good reminder. Uh, he was asked about Seritage Growth Properties, which is a company that I'm invested in. Uh, I've done a number of videos about Seritage, as many of you know. Uh, he says, Seritage, we bought a stake in the second quarter of 2020, right? I think it was May that Pabrai, I think, bought like 12% or so of the common shares outstanding. Uh, he said the stock price was down 80% from where it was a few weeks before that, right? If you look at the price over the last year for Seritage, it just dropped off a cliff. I think it went from like 45 down to 5 or something like that, which would be a 90% drop. Um, he said, maybe that will give you some clue as to why I might be interested. Okay, It's really that massive drop that got Pabrai interested. Uh, There's a discount, right? He could buy at a discount. He knew the business. He had owned it before. Um, now, he was clear to state Seritage is not a spawner. Okay, He bought Seritage before you know, this kind of spawner uh, framework really kind of took hold. Um, he doesn't regret buying Seritage. He's, he's happy with the investment so far. Um, but it's actually an unspawner. It's the opposite of a spawner because they keep selling assets to keep the ship going, right? To pay for, um, you know, the expenses, the redevelopments, uh, to keep the doors open. So an unspawner, Seritage. Um, lastly, he says, it's a big advantage in investing to have run a business before, okay? But Brian doesn't think he'd be able to come up with this spawner framework uh, if he didn't, you know, have a business that he built in the 90s. And what's interesting here, uh, he was actually doing spawning in his IT services business in the 1990s. Uh, he was doing adjacent spawning, and he saw how little capital it took to create these adjacent spawners. It's a very powerful um, model for, for growth in a business um, for these you know, CEOs, these management teams, these businesses that have the right DNA. Okay? Not everyone can be a spawner. Uh, you gotta have the right um, elements in place. You've gotta have the right stuff in order to do this. Uh, in a way that that grows the business, that produces value for shareholders. So that's it, guys. That's uh, Pabrai's talk. Guys, this was, I think, my favorite uh, lecture that Pabrai has ever done. So I am just, I continue to be eternally grateful for all of the uh, incredible content that he puts out. Uh, and it's going to be a very fun ride over the next couple of years watching you know, what he does with these spawners. Um, and I actually made a post in Corner of Berkshire and Fairfax uh, trying to team up with others to identify some of these spawners. So if you're interested in joining the hunt, uh, find me on Corner of Berkshire and Fairfax and let's do some digging. Let's put our heads together. Let's try to find some of these sub $500 million market cap 
uh, apex spawners. And once we find them, of course, we can shoot these ideas over to Pabrai, pay it back, because I am just on cloud nine right now. This is very exciting stuff. Uh, and with that, guys, let me know if you have any questions about this stuff. What uh, jumped out most at you from this talk at Peking University? Uh, let's get it going in the comments, and I will see you all in the next video. Take care.